Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Global Innovation Readiness webinar series, Innovating for a Better World. And uh, this session's topic, which is Mastering Team Alignment and Collaboration Around the World, uh, featuring our speaker and international product leader, innovator, at Global Minds Network, Dr. Thomas Audent. And I'll be uh, your host and speaker as well, uh, Karina Jensen, um, a founder and executive director of Global Minds Network. So we'll get started very soon, but before uh, we um, launch into our readiness journey, just wanna make sure you're ready. So everybody uh, knows the Zoom webinar tool by now. And uh, just want to ensure that we have, let's see, Q&A chat, so you know uh, the rules of the game. Uh, if you have any questions for us, just type into the Q&A box. Uh, of course, chat for your comments, thoughts. And uh, what we will have on the program today is that I'll give you an overview for you on team collaboration and Tomas uh, give you uh, a really interesting perspective from his experience and, uh, and share stories. And then we'll conclude with Q&A uh, and exchange with you. Uh, so we look forward to a very interactive session. Uh, you will be muted during the presentation, but before we go ahead, I just wanna make sure everybody's out there. We're uh, okay, let's see. Uh, uh, if you wanna say hello, uh, tell us where in the world you're calling in from. Um, just want to make sure all is good. Can you hear me well? Great. Calling in from Toronto, from Atlanta. Namaste from Bengaluru, India. We have, okay, so everybody can hear me well. Looks like we're good to go. Excellent. Oh, we're going over to the US now, New Jersey, uh, back to Germany, Dusseldorf. Okay, we're going around the world. This is great. All corners of the world, Europe, Asia, North America. San Francisco, yes. All right. Okay, good to see everybody. Uh, we've got lots of sunshine here today. I'm calling in from Paris and uh, so happy to finally see some sunshine. Hopefully you're enjoying lots of sunshine where you are in the world. Ah, there we go. We went from Finland, so up north too. Good to see everybody. Okay, so let's get started on our readiness journey. A uh, little bit about our Global Innovation Readiness Series, Innovating for a Better World. Uh, we launched the series last year uh, to um, explore better ways of collaborating and innovating. And there was such great interest for the series, so we brought it back this year with the theme, uh, how to innovate for our world. How can we innovate our way out of this uh, pandemic uh, period and, and beyond? and how to ensure uh, effective collaboration. So we've been holding these uh, webinars uh, every last Thursday of the month. As you see, we've already covered several topics from global innovation strategies to co-creation to sustainable development goals. And uh, today, May 27th, we'll be focusing on mastering team alignment and collaboration around the world. Our purpose at Global Mass Network we're an international advisory who enables leaders and teams to collaborate and innovate for global and local impact. And we have an international team of leaders, innovators, change makers who share a vision of facilitating multicultural collaboration in service of global innovation performance. Our international advisors, uh, thought leaders, uh, sh uh, share extensive uh, global experience uh, at the intersection of innovation, leadership, multicultural collaboration, and digital transformation. Uh, so we service your global mind trust uh, with expertise in all of these areas along your innovation journey. Uh, and we take you on that journey through our global innovation readiness framework. Uh, so we can offer advice or we do offer advice and insights, uh, training, facilitation services uh, for every phase of your journey uh, from creation uh, to uh, execution. 
Uh, and we power that journey or empower you uh, through the enablers of vision, dialogue, and space. So looking at leadership development, inclusive leaderships, uh, co-creation to framing an inclusive dialogue through knowledge sharing and uh, team collaboration, and then uh, creating the space. Uh, so a thriving global innovation culture and team climate. So back to today's session, um, mastering team alignment and collaboration. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, some thoughts and inspirations from our global study, as well as uh, from um, my research around team collaboration. Um, so what we found from our global innovation readiness study this past year um, uh, from leaders around the world uh, who uh, gave their uh, thoughts on what is happening now in this digitally connected era, uh, this um, pandemic period, but soon becoming post-pandemic uh, has really transformed our working life to a digitally connected environment. And it's also changed the way that we collaborate. Uh, and uh, everyone's experienced this overnight. Uh, how are we connecting throughout this uh, network? Um, and as you see from the study, uh, References now are focused on uh, video first and foremost. Do make sure we have a good video platform. We're on Zoom now, but there are many others uh, to have that visual exchange and dialogue. Uh, and that's supported by a project platform. So whether you're working on MS Teams or Slack, how to ensure that there's a central uh, source uh, online that everybody can access. And in third place is on site and in person. It's important to uh, have that connection on site, collaborate with team members to build trust, build relationships. Uh, but it came in third place this year, which is interesting because when this global study was launched five years ago, uh, on site in person was in first place, first and foremost, that relationships, trust building, every project starts with an on site and or in person. Uh, kickoff or event. Uh, and of course, you know all of the others. We see email messaging uh, and mobile apps, uh, also visual platforms, Miro, Mural, ways to ideate and co create online. Uh, so we all of these technologies, we're living on these digital platforms these days, but then the question is then how do you collaborate uh, on these platforms? How can you be most effective? Uh, it's uh, challenging enough to collaborate with team members on site, team members from different cultures, different disciplines, uh, but how do you do that online uh, when often you don't have that visibility uh, and also differences in communication, language? Uh, and time zones. Uh, so what we found from the global study, the collaboration challenges have not changed very much uh, in the last five years. So a trust building is still at the top. It becomes even more important to build trust in a digital environment and virtual environment. Uh, and uh, then the question of engaging teams, how do we engage them? Uh, and especially when everybody's remote in their own locations. Uh, and then um, conflict management. Uh, many teams felt or team leaders felt we're not spending as much time online uh, or we avoid being online too much because there are too many conflicts. So how do you ensure that you can create an open environment uh, and resolve any conflicts? Uh, and then how to share knowledge uh, across the world uh, and then encourage uh, teammates to still take risk to initiate more as you're collaborating online. So these were the big challenges. Uh, then what uh, could be the uh, solutions or opportunities? So we turned that around and in conversation with these leaders or surveying these leaders uh, found that to increase trust, to facilitate team collaboration, uh, the focus needs to be on relationship building much more uh, and looking at how you need to spend even more time when you're working virtually or remotely on relationship building. Uh, doing that through an inclusive dialogue, uh, ways to listen to team members, make time to listen uh, and understand uh, what team members, uh, what knowledge or expertise they have to offer, uh, uh, how they would like to contribute on a project and then how to respond to those team members. Uh, so there was 
the aspect of listening, but then how are leaders actually responding? Are they just listening or are they responding and delivering on their promises to team members around the world? Because um, that's part of trust building. Uh, and again, how to develop open assistant communication. This was important uh, in terms of the platforms and tools used uh, to ensure that there is weekly or even daily communication and uh, that that's infused, integrated throughout the project collaboration process. Look at managing virtual teams around the world. Uh, we have to consider what are those cultural influences. So there's obviously time and distance. Uh, we are all aware of those different hours, different time zones. Uh, how do we manage that across the world? Uh, still searching for that one hour, uh, that one time zone um, uh, that will be good for every region in the world, but that's pretty difficult because usually we know that one region or certain countries need to either call in very early in the morning or very late at night. Uh, so looking at how to vary that and making it comfortable uh, for teams around the world, uh, relationship building uh, and how that plays out culturally, as we know, uh, it could, uh, we see in uh, the Nordics or Northern Europe and North America as well, uh, often uh, the, there is not that much need to build that relationship or spend that much time on socializing at the beginning of a Zoom call or a video call, uh, yet uh, found colleagues in other parts of the world and, and uh, South America and parts of Southern Europe or Asia, uh, welcome that opportunity to spend some time on connecting and socializing at the beginning of a call or even after the call. Uh, to develop the relationship. Um, and then there's a sense of space. How do you create a comfortable space, a virtual space where everybody feels safe to share their knowledge and ideas, especially when they don't master the language well, or depending on the language that everybody's using, how you as a leader can create a space where everybody feels welcome and invited. How, how do you invite people uh, to contribute their ideas and thoughts? Uh, and risk, that's part of risk taking too, uh, and creating that safe space. Uh, we know language, uh, and I know many of you out there have uh, stories around this, you know, how to master language and how to be understood in one or many languages, as we have different accents, different mastery of languages, uh, and communication style, uh, and especially online, um, to have, ensure there's enough time uh, for people to communicate, uh, some who want to express themselves in story format or more verbally, those some who just want to be direct and present the facts or you know short responses so uh it's a really a way of facilitating that dialogue that leader needs to put more thought into that uh and uh, to create a more dynamic meeting um and so if we look at uh, solving that or, or how to develop a better structure uh, i always like to look at social structure and it structure uh, so it's a design uh, um, initiative. Uh, it's, it's a fun way to uh, look at how can the leader design a process for the team uh, and create a good rhythm uh, and uh, a dynamic interaction. So it's their social structure to think about, ass assessing the team's knowledge around the world. How do they master social media uh, or which tools or platforms are most comfortable for them? That everyone can embrace a certain platform, certain tools. Uh, and how does that play out culturally? Uh, for example, I've seen in the field at times I, I, I've seen for companies like it's, it's Siemens and, um, and Lenovo who have uh, implemented platforms, uh, knowledge sharing platforms, which where they expect it was self-serve. So it's very North American, more um, Western thinking that, oh, well, everybody goes to the platform and they serve themselves, right? You're supposed to initiate and contribute and uh, to that knowledge. Um, but that wasn't as evident from many colleagues, for example, in Asia who didn't feel comfortable. They wanted to be invited to the platform uh, to um, uh, be able to contribute. Uh, and so those are uh, what we need to think about in terms of cultural differences too. How are people using that platform and how are they invited to participate and contribute? 
And so looking at, again, going back to that space as a leader, how to create an open and safe space on that platform where, where people enjoy uh, contributing or sharing and uh, how you will facilitate that exchange. And that uh, also depends on the IT structure. So usually looking at three key tools or looking at one for the process, the team process or collaboration process, that weekly team meeting or way where people, the team members can come together and share that knowledge. Uh, and also having a project management tool. Where is that one um, project platform uh, where everybody can access information 24 seven around the world? And then finally, of course, communication technologies and tools, uh, quick tools where you can um, have a one-on-one -on -one with uh, team members to build that relationship and check in, get an update, uh, whether it's WhatsApp or, or a Zoom call or uh, just a way to have one-on-ones uh, and a more personal exchange. Uh, to wrap this up, uh, uh, what we see is how the role of the leader is really becoming a knowledge facilitator. So you as a global team leader, a global innovator, uh, um, your role will more and more be and how will you facilitate and, and help your teams connect uh, to the digital network around the world? How will you be able to design a process that's very engaging and where team cross-cultural teams feel comfortable to share? And it starts with social networking. So how to encourage those connections uh, uh, through your platforms and tools to develop uh, that network. And once uh, those connections are made, how to encourage more knowledge sharing, having making moments for your team to share knowledge. Uh, think about uh, events, anything from virtual cafes to cafe roulette or, or pop-up uh, calls. Uh, there are creative ways to share knowledge. Uh, and I've seen with clients also, they've created a, internal YouTube videos or ways for um, team members to share around the world, creative ways to share what they've learned uh, in their markets or what they know, sharing their expertise. Uh, and that transforms into cross-cultural learning. Uh, so again, it's about the project process, that global innovation journey, how you as a leader will facilitate that knowledge uh, through a platform uh, that in, is safe and invites interaction. Uh, and then that you create those moments for connecting workflows throughout that project process. Uh, and uh, also to uh, ensure that you have those collaborative tools that everybody can embrace. Uh, and that way uh, you can enjoy a more open and dynamic uh, collaboration process around the world. So I'd like to invite my uh, colleague, our international product leader and innovator, Thomas Arendt uh, here at Global Minds Network. Uh, Thomas is a passionate entrepreneur, innovator, inventor, uh, product leader. Uh, he uh, has an impressive background and has led uh, international initiatives uh, from numer at numerous uh, uh, large high-tech multinational firms in Silicon Valley, and many names of which all of us recognize uh, from SAP to Google to Twitter, Airbnb, uh, Facebook. And uh, uh, he has um, experienced um, ways, creative ways, innovative ways to lead these teams uh, to uh, ensure successful initiatives. And Thomas is today Senior Product Director at Johnson & Johnson. So now uh, looking at harnessing all this experience uh, and looking at how to reimagine how health and well care can be accessed, which is so relevant today. Uh, so Thomas, uh, I would like to invite you to share your wonderful story and uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Claudine. I'm so, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me back. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to sharing some of my stories today. Uh, let me actually bring up my screen real quick. You should see it now. Cool. All right, so uh, I'm, I'm, I was planning to spend the next unforgettable 15 to 20 minutes uh, with, with the panel and with the participants here, uh, talking about my personal story and talking a little bit about my experience and what all of this means, what, what you, Karina, just 
introduced as concepts and as frameworks and just give some some share some of my my insights from from doing this for for several years uh, pre and, and during COVID, of course. Um, but first, hello and hello in a different language. This is Italian in case you don't know. Ciao. Uh, just to set the tone for this presentation, my name is Tomas, as Karina said, uh, and uh, I have done a bunch of things, worked at those companies, helped create a, a number of other companies and have been a speaker at a, a number of universities. But really what I've been passionate about is working with people and creating products for people around the world and really understanding like taking product management to the next level and and really creating products that create a positive tangible positive impact on people's lives. This is a company I started seven years ago before uh, everyone and their neighbors dog walkers uh, friend would be taking classes on zoom so this was a, a passion project turned into a business which was called savvy it was a platform where anyone with any kind of expertise could teach and people could learn from each other all kinds of, of things as you can see here in this little visual it was a, a great experience uh, back in the days especially when it was uh, more of a, a harder sell sorry let me just move this more of a harder sell of getting people to be on video for for those kind of things think about ballet dancing and we actually had people learning how to swim and, and dive online. I still don't know how exactly that worked. Um, before I start, a couple of clarifications. So um, when, when, I, when I looked into this in preparation of this, of this uh, talk, so I'm talking about mastering team alignment and collaboration around the world. And I came across uh, a bunch of fairly confusing terminology. So I saw remote, distributed, and virtual, like interchangeably. And depending on which article you read, they, they are used for one or for the other. And I, I think it's, it's important uh, to start with your own definition and to, to start with like, how do you, how do you look at your, your team, your, uh, you as an individual, uh, is someone remote? Is a team distributed? Is a team virtual? I don't want to think of people to be virtual. We're all real, very real, even if we are online. Uh, teams can be virtual in the sense that they may not be a, a team with like one set reporting structure, but um, there are different definitions out there, not splitting hairs around terminology, but it can be useful to just get a sense for what does it all mean? What, what are we, which terms do we use? Are we remote or distributed or virtual? Uh, to, to the extent that it has meaning in, in your day-to-day -day communication. Uh, it also might set the tone. If you, if you look at someone as virtual, uh, they, may not be, they may not feel that they're part of the team or they may not be fully invested. So uh, I, I leave it up to you and to the audience to, to figure out how you want to define those. There are some good definitions online. Um, and uh, just to be more mindful when you when you use those terms, especially if you if they refer to your team or to people that are in locations that are not yours. And also, who is remote? Are you remote, or is the other person remote? Is everyone remote? Uh, just a quick reminder. Secondly, uh, Karina mentioned that in in her in her opener. Um, if, before I jump in, I forgot something important. I will leave time at the end for Q&A. So this will be about 15 to 20 minutes. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A channel here, but also I will, I will stop my presentation way ahead of time before, before our, our ends and we'll make sure that uh, you have a, a chance to jump in. I forgot to say that earlier. Let's talk about culture. So when, when, I, when I work with, with teams, that are all over the world that are in one location with some satellite offices or that are all at different locations i realize that people often talk about culture what does it even mean and I, I hear a lot about cultural differences well i like to think of culture as cultural influences as also Helena told us uh and, and an opportunity and uh I looked it up, so this is what my dictionary says, what culture is, and one thing stood out for me. It's like they call it the integrated pattern of human knowledge, belief, and behavior that depends upon the capacity for symbolic thought and social learning. That to me is really at the core of creating something together, doing something as a team. So you have to look at culture if you want to bring teams together, individuals from different cultural backgrounds together. Now, um, for me, that was that was eye-opening in the early days of my of my professional career because 
they were just some things that I was not prepared for. And, and I had some aha moments and some, some really eye-opening experiences that I'd like to share with you. And some, some are silly, but, but all of them I learned from. Like my first experience was this. This is a traffic light. At least that's what I thought a traffic light looks like. And then um, I traveled outside of Germany where I grew up and suddenly saw this. And it was completely confused. Also, what didn't help is that I'm so colorblind that I can actually not see what is red and yellow. And I personally had to rely that when the top light comes on, that means stop. Well, not everywhere and not necessarily what, what, I what I would expecting. Why am I giving you that example? Well, that really shook me up in my core beliefs of what, what is right and what is wrong and how are things done. It was a good reminder not to take things for granted and not to assume that my worldview is, is necessarily the same as everybody else's. Uh, and I, I kind of gravitate toward those, those different types of, of experiences. I'll show you another example. This is something that would be considered rude where I grew up, not having your, your hands on the table. You see uh, the person on the, on the right on your screen, she has her, her arm under the table, which would be like the, the, the weirdest things you could possibly do, but then it depends. So, so like where I grew up, this was the standard, well, not the chicken in the, in the middle, but uh, everyone having their hands on the table. So something as simple as eating can be so different. And of course we know this was my first, uh, first team lunch, um, eating with my hands uh, in Bangalore. And that was something that was an absolute no, 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 of wh where I grew up. But then I, I had to, again, open my mind. Is it like hands off the table, hands on the table? Is it eating different, different style? Lots to learn. Even more adventure awaits when I, I traveled to India for the first time and I took a bus. And taking a bus, I thought, is the same everywhere in the world. So what, what could go wrong? Well, um, I went wrong in my assumption and in my, in my background, in my assumption how things work. Even though they look similar, they might be different. And also to understand that different can be better. Um, so so here's, here's a little bit of, of a, a, a insight into, into my brain at the time. So, this is me waiting for the bus. On the top, this is me in Berlin, Germany. On the bottom, this is me in Mumbai, India. So bus arrives and oh, look, there's one person on the bus. Bus is empty, there's just one person on. Um, what would I do in Germany? Well, I would get on the bus and where would I sit? What do you think? I'll give you a second. Where would I sit on this bus? Oh, I'll tell you my honest, my honest answer and the culturally appropriate answer would be as far as possible from the other person. I would give them space. It would be considered rude to, to kind of crowd them and to be too close to them. So that's that would be a natural choice to stay as far as possible away from each other. This is what I experienced in Mumbai. Now I was on the bus. Well, to be honest, the bus in Mumbai was actually much more crowded than this, but um, in a situation similar to this, you would typically sit right next to the other person or near them. Now, just think, why did I give you that example? Well, just think what that means for teamwork, for, for having a team of people working on projects. If you give them individual tasks, would they like create as much space as possible between them and kind of do their own thing and, and really sit like as far as possible uh, in, in the bus, uh, as far as possible away from each other? Or would they try to, to crowd, or not crowd, but really, Give each, give each other company, help each other out, be close to each other. I was not prepared for that. And that was one of the, one of the, the, the more interesting insights that I got in the, early on and, and still appreciate that insight. And of course, different ways of doing simple things, like changing uh, business cards with two hands instead of one, never writing on a business card, very different customs, different traditions. And to me, that has always been fascinating. And I've always been trying to understand how that how does that translate into how do people work? How do people get things done? And how can I turn that? How can I leverage that? How can I turn that into uh, an advantage? Having like being so fortunate to work with people from different backgrounds and bringing that in to expand my own horizon, but also to make my team stronger and more diverse. How, how can I use this? 
the the biggest culture clash I've I've always experienced is with something Karina alluded to, which is this, which is like discussion culture in the business setting, where I found that again, this is a stereotype, definitely not true in in, in general, but I've seen more examples of when I did uh, business in Asian countries, for example, where it was a lot about really harmony and and leaving a meeting in a way that we feel good about, about the meeting, that we keep face, that we treat each other with respect. Well, you would expect that everywhere, but if, if you have this the very same business meeting in like France or Germany, there is like a, a very different structure. There's a thesis, antithesis, and synthesis at the end, and it's totally fine to have a passionate, passionate debate and to tell people that they're wrong. Can you imagine that? Now I live in hippie dippy California, where everyone is cool and everyone is okay. Telling someone they are wrong would be uh, the biggest offense. Um, but that's totally what you can do if you have a better argument. And you can still leave the room not feeling that this impacted you in a personal way at all. It was just a passionate debate about the subject. So, so people really have a different discussion culture, to use that word again, uh, which is also fascinating and requires not only adjustment on, of a leadership style, but also like, how can you use that? How can you, how can you use that as an advantage? And how can you make sure that not one of those is dominating the other? How do you bring both together? Because they can be contrasts or con even contradicting, right? Can I leave in harmony and yet have different, different models on the table that we discuss passionately? Yes, it's totally possible. It's just a way of how you run those meetings, how you kind of distill the essence, and how you make sure that those passionate debates never get personal, and that they always stay on the topic, and that you build that community and alliances. Let's talk about change. So for me, the landscape is changing, and that is not only due to the pandemic, but that kind of helped accelerate a couple of things. But let's take a closer look. So. Um, I worked for Google at at at, at the time, uh, and as you know, Google started in a garage. So this is the garage on the left in Palo Alto, where Google started, and then Google turned into this big company with like all those like crazy awesome offices and perks, and they built a great community of of people. And now, 2021, we are basically back to the garage almost. So it's it's like kind of went full circle in a way that people now work from home on their computer in in, in some corner. And I, I find that interesting. And and to me, that is not a step back. In fact, if you think about if you think about it, a lot of companies actually try to recreate this garage uh, flair or this garage setup to to create some innovation within a larger company. So a lot of and, and in fact, actually, Google, when when they grew, they actually created a project named Google Garage, where they would fund small skunk works projects and try to to make them larger. So it's very interesting how you can look at this as like, oh, man, this this thing happened and we have a pandemic and now everyone works from home. Or if you say, oh, this is actually a really cool opportunity to tap into like different styles of working, but also different ways of to ideate and different ways of bringing people together. I, I thought that was really interesting to kind of go back to the roots in a different way. So let's look at this 2019. This was before COVID hit. Uh, what did our work environments look like? Well, here's a company, a uh, local company, biotech, big office building, big labs, people in white coats working. They still do this, of course, in labs. Um, people working in, in offices. There's, they work on projects, but also there's some community. Uh, it's, it's probably easier to navigate than the online world is. Uh, but still, also, like a lot of us have experience with video conferences. Not everyone had such a fancy setup. Sometimes it was just a screen and a, and a, a cam or a laptop that was connected to a larger screen. But a lot of big offices had these kind of setups. So, a lot of us online and people who might listen or listen to this uh, webinar might know this from from their own work experience. And this is like way before Zoom was a thing, as Kalina said. So a lot of us have experience in, in video conferences. But then this is a very different setting. So this is a professional setting. Everyone is like nicely framed. Uh, light is good. Audio video is good. No lag typically. So this just typically worked and also was like Prohibitive, prohibitively expensive for people, people's home setting, but in offices it worked fairly well. Let's look at 2021. 
this is where we are right now. So we're all at desks. Mine doesn't look as fancy as this one and this uh, polished uh, stock image. But this is kind of the promise to say, oh, look how awesome the feature is. You can work from home. You can work with your colleagues. This is great. And technology solves all your problems. Well, let's, let's double click on this. So there's some challenges with this that I want to highlight. And that those challenges, you're all aware. So this is kind of the promise. So, so this is like, oh, hey, we're also friendly. We are all like connected. Uh, this is very obviously a fake picture. Why is that picture fake? Well, I'll, I'll explain to you. Well, a reality is more like this. So this is a little bit harder to keep track of, but also even this picture is fake. How do I know? Well, this is the reality of Zoom calls. Mostly people have no pictures. They don't have their video turned on. They have poor lighting. They hide their faces. They have like their faces cut off. They show something else. So this is what I usually work with. How are you going to collaborate, assuming this was your team? This is a random screenshot I captured off the web, but how are we going to create this connection that really requires this, like people looking at each other, people like having eye contact. This is like, it's like the, whenever there's a virtual character in a movie, you recognize them immediately from their eyes and from their faces because we are so optimized. Our brains are so optimized. And, in seeing faces. We even interpret faces into patterns that are not real faces, like on Mars, a rock formation. We need this. This is what we need. We need to look at people. That's how we build trust. Uh, eye contact is a thing. But you know what the problem is? This is. Right now, I'm faking it. I'm looking right at the camera. And that gives you the illusion that I'm looking right at you. If this was a video call, if I actually looked at you, I would do this. I would look down. And I'll illustrate this here. How awkward would that be if in real life you meet someone, let's say you run into your friend on the street, and instead of them looking at you, they look down about the, the height of your waist, let's just say. They, how, wouldn't you think something is weird and often awkward? Yeah. And so what, 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 can, what can you do? Well, you can either fake it, you can look into the camera as I do right now and kind of not really look at the audience down here. Or we can get used to this. My prediction is there, there is no getting used to this. We are kind of hardwired to, to this like eye contact. There's some technology uh, that's coming our way. Philip Rosdale, who created Second Life, uh, created a platform called High Fidelity. And he has done a lot of research in this space to kind of correct our, our vision or like how we appear on camera so that it looks like I can actually connect. But it's like right now, current technology, if I have a, even a one-on-one -on -one video call with someone, you never look the other person in the eye, ever. It does not work unless you have special setup. And that's a big challenge. So think about that. Uh, talk about, let's talk about communication in general. So here's a water cooler example that I gave before to say, okay, here's a traditional office setting and uh, let's look at number of encounters per day so if i'm in a setting like this or a more open floor plan well obviously with distance between me and my coworker, the number of encounters goes down but it, it to me it was amazing to see that this is about at around about 90 feet so even not thinking about being distributed in geographic locations if I sit 90 feet or more from my, uh, if I have my desk 90 feet or more from someone else's desk, chances are almost zero that we run into each other by chance. So what do employers do? They put these things in and they strategically locate them or micro kitchens, it's the same thing. They strategically locate them so people have to congregate and have to actually move from their desks. And sometimes they actually move them in, in one corner of the office so that you have to walk more. Uh, not only to for you to get exercise, but also so you get to run into your coworkers. So how do you how can you recreate that online? How can you create the virtual water cooler? How can you create a place where people run into each other by chance, by coincidence? Those chance encounters are more important than every business meeting you can ever schedule. We have all our Zoom meetings, all our like online meetings. How can you recreate that? Can you have can you have like a, a standing meeting that people get dropped into randomly? Can you create a random lunch, how we call it, at, uh, at Google? A couple more ideas. Uh, so a few more minutes to go here. Uh, very, very uh, quick. 
when you have the situation of online, you have to figure out how do you communicate and think of frameworks for communication, listen, decide, communicate. Interestingly, if this is the axis for communication, clear or unclear and delivering bad or good news, the place where you, where you create the most trust is down here. When you, when you communicate clearly and you have to deliver bad news. Um, the others are important as well, but something to think about. What do you want to focus on? How do you deliver tough news? Um, giving people choices. So what can people do on your team when they're, when they're, um, when, when they, when, when you want to empower them, you want to really help them create something amazing. Well, empowering your team is a lot about motivation. And if you think about how do you motivate your team, any team, a, a team that you work with physically or a team that is elsewhere, people that you've never seen perhaps, well, it's always the same. It's like, you can't motivate anyone. It's like that's an in intrinsic intrinsic value or intrinsic feeling that gets created, but you can create the, the, the environment for this. And Daniel Pink uh, has this framework of autonomy, purpose, and mastery. If you haven't heard that, look it up. It's a quick YouTube video summary, which summarizes that beautifully, what that is to really show, oh, here are some frameworks that are proven to be su successful. It's very simple to, to apply to people's work environment and, and to really set people up for success and empower them. Um, collaboration uh, is, is of course important because you don't want people to feel isolated. And as Karina mentioned, there are a bunch of tools that you can use. And I, I looked at what are the tools that I use most often? Well, they are really just for, for different categories. And yeah, you can add a lot of others, but it's really about scheduling, including project management in a way. Then there's real-time and asynchronous communication and collaboration, if you wish. And my, my tools, there are many others are as simple as these. Like I have a calendar, shared Google Calendar. Then there are some, some communication tools. And for collaboration, just a shared document like Google Docs and spreadsheets works just fine. Uh, looking at communication real quick to zoom in, so what you want to do is you want to create a human connection and here it is really important that you you pick the tool that gives you the strongest human connection remember what i said about the eyes well i want to add that 80 percent of our communication is nonverbal. if you just if you see someone you already get like a lot more information you can read them better than if you just hear their voice or if you just get a chat and email is probably the worst because it's not even real time and it doesn't express like feelings, there's a lot of way to misinterpret. So I sorted them from left to right to where I think they have the biggest potential to create human connections. So if you can go for a video conference or, or video chat over a phone call uh, and do that over a chat message. Again, everything at its time, you don't wanna be on the phone all day long if a quick chat message does it. Um, but also think about what's coming next, AR and VR. What ways are we going to have to, to be present virtually? Quick uh, to, to round this up very quickly, virtual meetings. So there's a lot to say to have an agenda, to have a framework, how you run virtual meetings, to always send minutes to make sure that people know what's what's to expect. Brainstorming, Karina mentioned that before, there are tools for brainstorming, but how, how, how do we actually do that efficiently? Well, ideally this is what this looks like. And what this is, is actually a space regardless of the actual visual design of this or the design of the space. And I don't know what that golf thing is there on the left, um, but basically it's a physical space where your team, here's a brainstorming team of four, say this is a project team where you can actually come back to. And we are so good, our brains are so good at building spatial memory that if we leave that room and we come back tomorrow, we know exactly, oh, uh, Jennifer's idea was there on the lower right. And there, this concept was here on the left. We orient ourselves that actually in space that actually some some memory techniques mnemonic techniques use space like if if you if someone if you see someone kind of name all the numbers of pi or or like can memorize a hundred things that's what they use they have a walk through through a physical space typically a, a, their home or something that they're very used to and guess what you can recreate that virtually well there are some fancy ways of doing that virtual spaces can look like this. So this is actually not real. This is a, a computer generated virtual space that you can join, but it can be much easier. It could be just you creating a, a combination of docs and spreadsheets that people can come back to at any time. And that kind of orients them. It doesn't have to be the fancy version. There are other fancy versions, of course, robots. 
Sure, we all like robots, robots are the future. This is me as a virtual uh, employee on the top right, talking to one of my colleagues at an office in Mountain View, where we're both remote, uh, but kind of roaming around the office. So this can be fun. Will, will those robots look like this? I don't know, but um, I think it, that was fun. But also just a simple, on the bottom right, just a simple screen that kind of is online all the time. So uh, if and when we go back to offices to just have a visual to other team members. A uh, couple more minutes before I'm done here. So control control for me is who drives projects? What are, what are responsibilities? And I, have, I wanna share with you an exercise that, I, that was but one of the, the most impactful ones, which is was a setup like this. So we have a team and the team is split up into two teams actually. The, the task is to set up a tent. And here people who can touch the tent have their eyes for their, their eyes blindfold, they're blindfolded. Yeah. And people outside of the circle cannot touch the tent or anything else. They they can see what's going on. Um, so that's that's the setup. And so what happens is, of course, people that can touch the tent get kind of frustrated. Some check out, like the person on the top right, he goes like, oh, I'm done. Uh, people outside try to help. Now they touch the tent, even though they're not supposed to. Um, so, so you can watch this and you can do this exercise on your own if you like to. This for me was the most insightful and a great metaphor for what I had done at the time when I had a team in India. I essentially was one of those bystanders which told my team in India what to do. Uh, and they had like very limited visibility and didn't have the full picture and kind of ex executed uh, instructions that I gave them, which was like the worst way to run a team. So how can you take those teams blindfolds off? How can you define team roles so no one checks out like these people here on the on the sidelines? Um, uh, two, more, two more quick things. One thing is building community. So just be thoughtful in hiring and also in team building. I mean, that doesn't really appear on a lot of slides, but um, as you build your team, you set the values, you set the tone, you want to make sure that people on your team um, fit in and also have this like international spirit and, and can kind of uh, really bring in others. And the last, my last point that I'm going to make is creativity. If you want to create something together, if you want to really, really go uh, above and beyond, you have to include this like cultural diversity or neurodiversity in your plan. Here's a quick exercise that many of you have seen before. There are two number rows, 147, 235. What's the next number in this row? Give me one second. All right, so many people would say 10 and eight because that makes for a nice mathematical pattern. Well, I would say, how about 11 and six? Why 11 and six? Well, these are all words uh, one is the first number that has three letters, four is the next number that has four letters, five letters, six letters, and so on. And why the six? Well, because it conveniently is located on a number block of my keyboard. So you would have chosen a different number. I have the right to, to choose my numbers because maybe my brain works differently uh, or I have different patterns. So take neurodiversity into account. A very good way of practicing this is to practice failure and practicing failure is what improv does improv theater is what it's called but i would say improv is just generally a very good management exercise uh, and um it is okay to fail and uh here's why this is a very, very quick show so people talk about why it's so important to fail to fail together to have to have this trust to, to learn how to say yes and, that's the core. I'll stop this here in the, in the interest of time, but uh, really using improv as a collaboration tool, as a team building tool is so powerful and can be done online. And it allows teams to say yes and to each other, to use what improv improvisers would say, something that goes wrong in your perspective as an offer and to build on it and to create something great from it. So those are my uh, 10 plus one C's uh, that I talked to you about. And with that, I will stop my presentation. Wow, thanks Thomas uh, for a wonderful presentation and uh, lots of great insights. Uh, and I see we have some questions. I'm gonna pitch a question to you, uh, which um, 
uh, place on your experience because you uh, shared these wonderful insights and I've known you for a long time and have been able to see your collaboration work at companies like Google and Twitter and Airbnb and so on. And where did you find in leading these global initiatives, where uh, did you find uh, that there was a really a successful example, the most memorable for you uh, in uh, collaborating with these global and, and uh, virtual teams? I would say that's a great question. Thank you for, for sharing that. I would say there isn't one company that does that really well, but there are some companies that have some, some aspects that I try to kind of take on. So for example, um, Facebook loves strong frameworks. So, so they have a product uh, production framework and some standards they call understand, identify, execute. So everyone at the company kind of knows how Facebook thinks about building products, which really helps. It creates a common language. Um, also, they have some frameworks around extreme clarity. And that's small things, like when you send an email um, or when you create a document, don't use bullet points. Use numbered items so people can refer to them. They, they don't have to say, oh, that thing that you said in there, they can say 3C. Uh, here's something. So small things, but really that drive that make things more efficient. Google has wonderful frameworks in, in really defining roles and responsibilities. Um, a lot of those companies are kind of challenged with, with really giving their remote teams, I deliberately use this, more control. A lot of those companies are, are remote controlled by the headquarters and that still remains an issue. So I think all of those big companies can actually work on really distributing decision making more and giving more control to, to other teams and putting them in the driver's seat rather than really driving everything from headquarters. So there's still some some ways to go. But I, I think I'm, I'm kind of picking the best of all worlds and apply that to my respective role in whichever company I work for right now at Johnson & Johnson. Yeah, I remember one of my favorite examples uh, was at Airbnb, where you shared how uh, every country could uh, share their own stories, local customer stories, they, um, and creating a more a better team dynamic that way. Absolutely, yeah. Airbnb is a hyper local company. In fact, they started here in San Francisco, but then had like worldwide success instantly because a lot of people came from all over the world, and then brought Airbnb as uh, as pioneers to their respective country and kind of spread the word uh, the word without being paid initially by Airbnb and then they've got paid in stickers and t-shirts uh, initially to 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 kind of start to uh, do the groundwork for the company and that is so powerful because those people are rooted in the community they understand what's needed they understand they speak the language and i don't mean just the the, the natural language but they also understand what exactly resonates with people what is what is important to give you to give you a sense? Um, Airbnb in Portugal is very different from Airbnb in Germany. Portugal is uh, struggling ec economically, uh, so so the message for Airbnb there is is more of like oh make some extra money as a host. Whereas in Germany it's more geared toward hey travel like a local, like a more affluent country would would latch on to the message of oh this is better than staying at a hotel. Where in some countries staying at a hotel is even is not even in the question. So that makes no sense. So to, to your point, absolutely, like really empowering local pioneers on the ground and empowering them and, and clearly using them as a seed is, is really super useful. And even at larger companies, I've seen major shifts when they handed up over control and instead of running like the weekly team meeting from headquarters, in letting those meetings run from, from their satellite offices, even in like the pre-COVID old model to say, oh, let's see how, how, would, uh, how would Bangalore run this meeting or how would Singapore run this meeting? Um, and, and also to explicitly encourage them to bring in as much local flavor and, and not just stick to a, a, a fixed like sequence of things and bring in some user stories. And that was incredibly powerful. Twitter did that quite successfully for a while. And they're probably still doing that, where they invite people from different offices to run the all hands team meeting. That's unheard of for some other companies. That's a great way to um, create more engagement and, and learn uh, from you know, your team members. Uh, we have more questions. Let's see, here's a question. What have you found to be effective means to deal with passive aggressive behavior when working across broad teams? 
Hmm, how does that uh, play out virtually? I mean, dark screens maybe or silence? Yeah, I mean, I think that's just if you think of like why is someone passive aggressive? Well, again, think of think of the the framework of of like how to motivate people. Well, you can, but how to create an environment that that motivates people with autonomy, purpose, and mastery, uh, as Daniel Pink said. I think you would first start like with like with a person who is passive aggressive to you. What, why are they that 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 way? Well, they are not aligned. They are unhappy. They are. They, they might not be aligned with the team goals. Maybe they don't really understand how what they do contributes to the larger vision. So, so that's on you, that's on managers, that's on everyone on the team to enforce. But also, as a manager, you have the power to address this. That's what one and ones are for. And the autonomy, purpose, and mastery framework really helps. And it's very simple. It's essentially boiling down to here's the big vision. The big vision is we want to go to Mars, stay there for three weeks, and then come back. It's not going to the moon, it's not staying there forever. So making this clear, especially as the mission changes, everyone has to be on has to be informed and bought into this. And the second important piece is here's how you, Karina, contribute to this project. Without you, we won't make it. Here's how you are essential for this project and how we need your contribution. Those two together build a very powerful combination so that you have meaning in what you do, you, you feel empowered, you know where you're going. And of course, people have difference of opinions, but you have to sort those out. You can disagree and commit as long as there's a respectful work environment and passive aggressive behavior to me always, I'm not Dr. Phil, but that always shows me there's some misalignment of goals and incentives. And I would start there yeah. and that works in person and virtually, I would have the conversation with the person. And also if someone doesn't, doesn't turn on their camera or doesn't wanna show, show Maybe they're embarrassed because they don't have a, a nice home setting. So it's it may not be passive aggressive. It's your interpretation. It's like they they feel bad because they have a, a small corner of their kitchen to to work from and it looks messy and they don't want to show a, or something else. Maybe they have cats and dogs and kids jumping around in the background. So that's why they're always mute and off camera. Who knows? So it's yeah. I think it's it's easy to judge, but it's also as easy to, to work with a person. As a good manager, you should be able to do that. Yeah, the, it was a follow-up question, but I think you already addressed it around office ego and politics uh, um, online. So I, I think you addressed that in your question. That was a follow-on from the same. It's, uh, source, I would say so it's, I think that... it's similar. I would address it in a similar way. I mean, again, online does not make everything worse and also doesn't make everything better so it's it's a different flavor but it's not solving any of those underlying dynamics it makes it harder in some case because we only have scheduled meetings uh, so it's impossible to just walk around and say hello unless you create the virtual water cooler <laughs> I mean, I think it's a wonderful, uh, it's very symbolic. Well, we only have two, three minutes left. And one more question, I guess we have, a, we have to give it a quick answer. How do you best obtain or retain engagement when working through video uh, platforms, digital platforms? Ooh, that's a big question. How are we gonna I like that. that. Thank you, Brian, for answering, for, for asking that question. Well, I mean, you wanna make sure that people are not just viewers. I mean, yes, right now we are in a webinar environment and thank you all for for posting questions on the chat and in q a but to also give people roles like just like in an actual meeting why are we here and if you invite a group of people to a meeting it should be clear what are the goals for this meeting and everyone should know why they are there because they can either take something from the meeting or contribute something to the meeting or both and that has to be clear so it would be good hygiene at the beginning to make sure everyone knows everyone else and everyone knows what we are here to achieve and so that everyone pays attention and also knows this is important to me because or here's something I can share that's important for others. So everyone stays engaged when they know why they're here. I turn off when I realize, oh, this doesn't apply to me or I don't even know why I'm here. And then maybe I shouldn't. And that could, is also OK. Maybe I should not be on this meeting if if I don't have a, a role in this. So then I can use my, my time otherwise. Just sitting there having yet another Zoom call is not useful. So that's like also empowering people on the team to say if there's a call that you can I will either not contribute to or learn from feel free to skip yeah and I think and what I've also observed is, is so important to have uh, shifting roles and ensure everyone has a part uh, you know to present so that they you have a very dynamic agenda where everyone participates uh, virtually and it's um, 
Yes. So I uh, want to thank everyone. Uh, great uh, session, uh, good questions, and uh, wonderful examples uh, from uh, Thomas Arendt. Uh, thank you again, uh, Thomas, for sharing those wonderful stories. Uh, I'm going to just, I wanted to share, remind everyone about our next uh, webinar session, uh, which is coming up, and that will be on uh, I'm, whoop, that would be on June and June 26th, our, our last session uh, and last stop on the readiness journey. So be sure to make it. Uh, and that's our global innovation and marketing leader, Brian Sam Cooley, who will be our key speaker. And uh, with him uh, will be a guest speaker, uh, Pete Dokamara, chief scientist and technical vice president at Kimberly Clark. And they will share their insights on driving global readiness from concept to market. So this should complete the global innovation journey for everyone. Uh, and I think you'll find it fascinating to see how uh, you'll um, be able to connect uh, moving from concept to execution and ensuring that you're ready for that journey. Uh, so uh, make sure to register. You've got the link there and uh, stay updated. You can follow us on LinkedIn, our LinkedIn page and very exciting news. Uh, we have our new playbook ready which shows you all the insights from our Global Innovation Readiness Study. Uh, you have uh, insights and advice from our international advisory team, uh, thought leaders, as well as the key uh, or six indicators uh, for readiness success. So make sure and check it out. You can download it there uh, at the link uh, on display. And uh, wishing you a wonderful journey ahead. Thank you. Bon voyage. We look forward to seeing you soon.